since we are still can be considered at the beginning of a new year, still in January, I thought I would like to preach something that will remind us of how we ought to live before God. It's good to also as we come to near the end of the first month of, of January to ask ourselves again, how have we, we been walking before God? Have we been faithful? Have we been growing in faith and love for our Lord Jesus Christ? Have we forsaken the past mistakes and sins that we were so fond of in the past years? Or have we fallen back to old patterns, old bad habits of not walking close to God? So my prayer is to remind us this morning with the word of God under the theme, let us live as children of light. Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Christians, you and I are called to be stewards. Stewards of all that God has placed in our hands. A steward is someone, usually a slave, who is put in charge of his master's property to manage the possession of his master. In other words, this steward does not own the possessions. It is, they are his masters. He is but a manager of his master's belongings. So in this parable of our Lord Jesus about this unjust steward, we are told that he has come to the knowledge of his master that this steward had been really unfaithful. And so his master told him that he is fired. But before he is fired, he is told to bring all the accounts which he had been handling to his master as soon as possible. And so knowing that his days of enjoying the provision of his master, of handling all these vast property possessions of his master that will be coming to an end, that his situation will therefore be desperate without all these provisions after being sacked, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I'm not strong enough to dig. Maybe he, he was really lazy even to dig. And then he said, to, to beg is too shameful a thing to do. What shall I do then? And then that light bulb moment came. Ding! I know what I'm going to do to, to provide for my future. Verse 4 tells us, he said, I'm resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. The day here refers to the debtors to his master's. Uh, to his master. And therefore, we are told in verse 5 to 7 that he quickly met up with all these debtors and in black and white greatly reduced the amount which they owe to his master. Now, these are loans that these people took from his master. It is not uncommon a practice. Uh, years ago, I dealt with some very poor farmers in Thailand, what they do is that they would also borrow money from the bank to buy their seeds, fertilizers, etc. And then when harvest time comes, they would sell back this produce to, to the bank and the bank will look for buyers to, to buy and then take, the, take back their loans with interest and all that and maybe give some to, to uh, the farmers to buy new seats and, and things like that. And so here we read of these people who, have, who had taken loans from his master and now this steward reduced their loan amount drastically. And his master would have to honour them because as a steward he was given the authority to make such decisions as he is the one, he was the one who handles all his uh, properties. And then, having done so, you can imagine this uh, steward just with a smug in, on, on his face and just drop off the account book and, and walk off as, uh, with, without any signs of remorse for cheating his master. And you can imagine also when the master took a look at the accounts, 
he would have noticed all the alterations. It was originally 100, now becomes 50, etc. And so he knew exactly what this unjust steward had done. This unjust steward had taken this last opportunity as a steward to, before being sacked, to make use of his position, make use of what belongs to his master to, or rather to rob his master in order to prepare for his days ahead after being sacked. And so our Lord Jesus said that the master of this steward, after seeing that, commended that the steward had done wisely. In the ESV is translated, the master commended him for his shrewdness. Note that the master was not commend, commending this steward for his cheating him, for stealing from him, but he was commending him for, for the steward's shrewdness. Much like how we would sometimes marvel at how some criminals could think of ways to commit their crime. For example, this true story which I heard about a couple, a couple who had their car stolen one day, and then a few days later, they, they saw their car uh, back uh, at their driveway, and with it was a note of apology, and also with the apology was two tickets for a concert for that night. So the couple took the tickets, went for the concert that night, and when they came home, they found their home ransacked while they were out at the concert. So, you know, nobody will say that this burglar, this, this terrible uh, uh, burglar had done right. But I'm sure most of us will say, wow, he was smart. He was shrewd to think of such a plan to, to, to get them away from the house and then he, so that he can ran, ransack the house. The same happened for this unjust steward. He definitely did wrong to his master, but he was shrewd in the sense that he did all he could to make sure that his future would be taken care of. Because now that he has done this favour to all the debtors, the debtors of his master would, having benefited from him, want to show their gratitude to him will want to show generosity to him in return. And so they would gladly receive him into their houses when he has nowhere to go, not just for a meal, even to allow him to stay for a period. Like this steward, beloved, we have to understand that every one of us is also made steward by God himself. Because all that we possess are God's, which He placed in our hands to manage for His glory. Yes, you possess them, your money, your things, etc. But in reality, you don't own them. God is the one who owns all them. And He can anytime take them away from us, isn't it? So we all are made stewards of God. And one day, one day, and may not be very long away from today, you and I will have to be called before God to give an account of our stewardship. Steward is not just only one who handles, manages the, the property or the, the, possess, the possessions of, of his master, but a steward is also one who will have to give an account to his master of what he does with them. So the question is, what have you and what have I done with our stewardship, with all that God has given us? So this morning, from this text, our Lord Jesus wants us to, first of all, live with eternity in mind. After saying that, the master prays his unjust steward for his shrewdness. The Lord Jesus commented that so often the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. 
The children of this world is referring to unbelievers. They are called children of this world because they live not only in this world, but for this world and for this life. While the children of light are, referring, are believers, they have been called out of their spiritual darkness into the, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. All men must die after a short life here on earth and then enter into eternity. But then it's striking oftentimes that unbelievers are more shrewd to plan for their days before they die, more intentional in pursuing security for this temporal life so that they can be as happy as possible and enjoy as much as possible within this short time that they have. They know they'll die, but they know they have days ahead to live, so they are intentional, they are really purposeful in preparing for all the days of their life that they can be happy, that they can live in comfort. And the, the unjust steward is really a good picture of that. But then the Lord Jesus says, in contrast with this children of the world, the children of light, the sons of light, seems to have a difficulty looking beyond that, looking forward to that glorious eternal future and to live in light of that. The Lord Jesus therefore wants us to learn from this unjust steward. Not in his way of cheating, not to cheat, surely it is wrong, it's sinful, but the Lord Jesus wants us to learn from his prudence, from his diligence, his determination in getting ready for his future. That we, as children of light, may also emulate him in the sense of getting ready for our eternal future. This steward plans for his future after he's been kicked out of his master's house, but we have to plan for our lives after we live this life. That we are to exhibit the same degree of urgency, give importance to it to live in the light of the coming glory, unless we don't believe it's reality. Or else, if it is real that we are going to heaven, then we need to prepare ourselves for it. Because what you believe about the next phase of your life will determine how you will live today. Is it not? Will it not? If, for example, you are going to sell your old car to buy a new one, would you spend a lot of money to do up this car and decorate it and all that? No. You can do, do away with this old one. But you would rather spend your time thinking how you are going to use your new car to come. So also, we know that there is a life to come after we leave this world. How are we living in light of that? Isn't it true then of what the Lord Jesus has said so often, Christians, the children of light, so-called, in the sense that they have been enlightened by the Spirit to see beyond this world, yet how often our life, it can hardly be seen in our life that we are people looking forward to the life, to the world to come. We, our life is so often indistinguishable from the non-believers. Because how often we too, like the world, focus solely on the here and now. Whereas eternity doesn't seem to feature at all in our lives. Beloved, if Christ were to come this morning to judge the world, I guess many of us, myself included, may just suddenly feel, no, Lord, I, I'm not ready. Lord, there's still so many things I hope to experience in this life. Can it be a bit later? I'm not ready to go. If you or I should feel like that, if Christ should come this moment, 
then there's a good sign to show that we might have forgotten that there is a life to come, there is judgment to come, there is a day of accountability. Ask ourselves then, what are the things we think about, what are the things that we worry about every day? What are the things that we spend our time, energy and money to pursue after every day? How many of those things are connected to your life to come? And how many to the here and now? And that will give us a picture of whether we are living rightly with eternity in mind. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, that it is wrong for us to buy a car, buy a house, go for holidays, to want to do well in school, do well in our businesses, in our job. There's nothing wrong with that. God gives us good things to enjoy, indeed, in the right way. But those are things that the world goes after too. So the question is, what's the difference between us and the world in, in having all these things? What difference does the reality of our eternal destiny make in how we treat these things, these possessions, and how we live in this life? We confess that we believe in Christ. We confess that we are kingdom citizens. Then our confession must match, must be backed up by real transformation in our lives. That we show ourselves to be truly kingdom citizens, citizens of God's kingdom. And, and that we are living in light of eternity. What we do with the here and now has eternal implications. And so don't just live for the enjoyment of the here and now, only to regret at the judgment seat of God. Beloved, young people too, don't think that you still have a long way to go in your life. Don't just live in the here and now with its, all its enjoyment and full stop. Then you will be like this unjust steward. You have not lived the way, you have not handled the possessions that God has given you the right way. So secondly, we want to consider is that besides having eternity in mind, so it, here now, God wants us to be faithful stewards. Firstly, God wants us to love Him with an undivided heart. Love God with an undivided heart. Verse 15 tells us, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. The mammon here is referring to generally money or broadly speaking all our possess, possessions here on earth, our earthly possessions. In fact, uh, in verse 9 is even called unrighteous mammon. Unrighteous mammon. Not that money, not that possessions are, are evil, but the, in the sense that possessions or money often is the root, often is that instrument that that means of unrighteousness to us. Why? Because we are sinful. As sinful creatures, we are easily be, uh, becoming drawn away by money, by possessions. That now money has our love instead of God. That now money becomes our God instead of God. That's what money possessions can do to us sinful creatures. And therefore, we need to be careful. Not that money is wrong, the root of all evil is the love of money, as the Bible tells us. So we need to know that money, even though it can be a good servant to us when rightly used, but it, can, it will be a terrible master if we give ourselves to it. And the Lord Jesus talked about love here. Either you will love the one or hate the other. 
it is the undivided love for God that we must have and not to have both and say, I want to love God, I also want to love possession. Jesus said, it is impossible. It is, you cannot serve God and mammon. It is impossible. You cannot. It is impossible to devote ourselves wholeheartedly to God and at the same time devote ourselves wholeheartedly to the service of mammon. Be careful because it is possible for someone to, to claim to serve God and love God when in actual fact we are not. Just like the covetous Pharisees. Outwardly, they are serving God, they love God. But the Bible tells us here that they were covetous and which was why they were offended at, at this parable of the Lord Jesus Christ and sneered at him and mocked at the Lord Jesus. Verse, 15, verse 14, we read of that. Don't forget that we cannot have a divided heart. We must love God with an undivided heart. Why? For God has so loved us. For God, our Creator, demands our love. Remember, not only that all that we have comes from God, but remember also how God has loved us to the point of giving His only begotten Son our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to live and to die for us. Beloved, can you not see how, how extravagant that love of God is for us in giving Himself, in even coming to the point of making a covenant to bind Himself with wretched sinners like us, ill-deserving sinners like us, so that He promises to save us right to the very end. Having received such love from God, how ought we to live today? Having received the knowledge that God is bringing us to that glorious home above, how ought we to live today? Beloved, is there anything in our lives that we are unwilling to give up if God should tell us to? Do you and do I love God enough that we are willing to suffer loss for His sake? Look at the example of the Hebrew Christians. Hebrews 10, verse 32 to 34, we read, But call to remembrance the former days in which ye were illuminated. Ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Do you see that? That the Hebrews Christians took joyfully the spoiling spoiling, the plundering of your goods, that people come into your house and take all that so-called belongs to you because you are a Christian, because God so allows them to, to do so, that they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Why they could Take it so joyfully, it's ridiculous, right? Someone can't plunder all that belongs to you and you still can have joy. But these people have joy, why? Because they know these are from God and these are temporal. But I have a better, better possession in heaven, in Christ Jesus. Beloved, are you faithful to mammon? Or are you faithful to God with your mammon. We ought to be careful and not let our hearts be divided in our love for God. We ought to be like what this hymn, uh, when I survey the wondrous cross, one of the stanzas says, were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small. 
Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's what we should remember, that we owe God our all, and so ought we to love Him. Secondly, we ought to serve Christ with all our resources, since all our resources belong to Christ. Verse 9, he says, uh, he, uh, we read, And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Even though many people in this world use their possessions wickedly and even make possessions their God, but believers ought to be different. Believers ought to use our possession in a way that promotes true and lasting friendship in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Believers need to use our possessions for the glory and honour of Christ of God, our Master. And so we are told here to make use. We are not to love mammon, but we are to make use, wise use of our possession so that when we fail, when we die, these friends that we have made, these friends that we, through what God has given to us, help them to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, benefited from us, will be at heaven's gate welcoming us and, and thank us for our kindness that we have shown to them in this earth. Then the, 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 the picture will be like the unjust steward. He was kicked out of his master's house but welcomed in the houses of all these uh, debtors that he had helped. But for us, once we are not so-called kicked out from this world, but we leave this world and enter into glory, we can be sure of people there also receiving us with joy into our everlasting habitation. So ours is better than the steward. The steward, he, he from an earthly house, gets into another earthly one. But for us, having forsaken, uh, having left the earthly one, gets into a heavenly one. The steward gets into a temporal one. One day, the people will also get sick of him and ask him to go and not be staying around all the time. But for us, it's an everlasting one, the Bible tells us. Leaving the temporal one for an everlasting one. What a great and wonderful day that will be. Hypothetically speaking, after this parable that the Lord Jesus spoke of another parable of the rich man and Lazarus, hypothetically speaking, if Lazarus would have loved God with a pure heart and so loved his neighbour as himself and, and helped Lazarus, the beggar that God placed in front of his house, can you not imagine the day when La uh, this rich man gets into heaven? Lazarus will be there to thank him. And so the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. God give us things to enjoy, not just for our selfish enjoyment, but that we do good, be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation, a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. That's the, the right use of possessions that God has given to us. But not that heaven can be bought by our good works or by our monies, because we know the only way to get to heaven is by faith in Christ alone, by grace alone. There's nothing in, in heaven that we can point to and say, you know why this is mine? This is mine because when I was on earth, I did this and I did that, I used my money wisely. No, all by grace alone. We cannot get to heaven 
by our good works, by money, etc. But we can use our possession rightly to glorify God, to, to bring good to our neighbours. By employing the time, the money, the energy, and anything that God has given to us in, for example, works of mercy, in helping people, the poor, contributing to the advancement of the gospel. God not only gives us physical, earthly goods, God also gives us spiritual possessions, the word of God, the wonderful gospel. How are we using that? Do we use that to, to make friends, to, to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ? So that when you and I are received up to glory, there'll be people there to say, you know, I'm here because God used you to bring the gospel to me. Because God used you to help me that day. And that's how I come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, beloved, it's not just for the praise of men that we want to go and hear these many people saying, wow, you were so good. No, no, no. But above all, the wonder of it all is our Lord Jesus Christ who will be there and will, He will tell us that we have been good and faithful servants. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. When we use, when we have been good stewards for Him. So whether you have one dollar or one million dollar, it does not make any difference. The point is what and how do you use that dollar? How do you use what God has given to you? One of the marks of a true Christian is how he uses his possessions. If he uses them for the advancement of God's kingdom and glory and therefore to the benefit of his neighbour, here is a mark of a true Christian and God will reward him richly in the life to come. So beloved, help, may God help us to use what God has given to us, the resources for His glory. And then the third thing we can learn from here is that we ought to be faithful also in the small things. Don't just think of big things but, and don't just think of only the rich can give but the poor can give. You Be faithful even in the small things. The Lord Jesus says in verse 10 and 11, He says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, to your trust, the true riches? You see, the true character of a man can be revealed by how he handles small responsibilities. If this person is responsible, is faithful in small things, then you can be quite sure he'll be faithful in the bigger things. While the opposite is true. If even small things, if even things that people place in your hands that you cannot be trusted, how can you be trusted with greater things? In fact, it's not just unfaithfulness. The Lord Jesus used the word unjust. He that is uh, faithful also in the mar march is, uh, he that is, yeah, is faithful, right? And he that is unjust in the list is unjust. He didn't say he that is unfaithful. Because when you are unfaithful, you are unjust. You are going against what God expects of you. So if you cannot, as mentioned, be handled, be, be trusted to handle and use possessions which are not yours, ultimately they are God's in the right way, then how can you expect God to entrust you with the true riches of salvation, the true riches of heaven that is yours by faith? Therefore, faithful stewardship in this life is, is, a, is the way that God is preparing us for the life to come also. Those who have been faithful in the least things, as Jesus says, the earthly things, God will place as stewards of heavenly riches, of heavenly things. So, beloved, it might be things that you might think are just small things in this life. Maybe some of us, you, you might have high positions, uh, woman, 
you might have high positions at work in, in society, but then you give up in order to become a mother, to, to teach your children, to, to bring them the Word of God, to guide them in the ways of the Lord. You might think that, oh, this is a small thing that I'm doing. But this, this, if you are faithful in that, this is what God delights in. This is what God will reward you for. Or even the little things of giving a track to somebody, of looking out children for opportunities to not just play with your friends, but to tell your friends about the Lord Jesus Christ. You might think these are small things. But if you are faithful even in such things, then God will entrust you with the heavenly riches which He shall give you when you live this life. So let us be faithful also in the small things, in everything that God places in our hands. And fourthly, I just want to highlight the point about the need to do it constantly, the need to do it with urgency, with, with great zeal. In other words, that we are to press into the kingdom of God. As faithful servants, we are to press into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said in verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John the Baptist, since the time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. The every man here is not saying head for head, every single human being presses into it, but, but a great number of people presses into the kingdom of God. So just as this unjust steward presses himself into the houses of other people by his scheme, by his terrible scheme, or, or very, very uh, shrewd scheme. So, just like Christ says elsewhere, we ought to strive to enter into the kingdom of God through repentance, through faith, through faithfulness in the Lord Jesus Christ. The original word for press here, presses here, has the idea of forcing into. It shows that there is this urgency, this, this great need, great, great effort, great concern that you must get in. You cannot be out. You want to press yourself in. So why would so many people, the Lord Jesus said, even during all these years to John the Baptist's time at the preaching of the kingdom of God, want to press into God's kingdom? It's because these people who presses in the kingdom knows that they, that they have a soul that will never die, that they must come to give an account before God. And so they need to press into the, the kingdom of God because their eternal destiny is at stake. Beloved, are you not concerned of your eternal destiny? Are you someone who only lives for the day? And also those dear friends among us this morning who are not saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, know that God similarly has given you all that you have enjoyed in your life, your health, your wealth, your everything. You are also to give an account before Him on Judgment Day. And therefore repent seek salvation in Him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow Him. And then you will also know what is the right use of all the possessions that God has given you to prepare yourself for the kingdom to come, pressing into the kingdom of God every day of your life because we are concerned for our souls, because we know there is a limited time to do so because we may not have tomorrow to do it. To be outside of God's kingdom is condemnation, is hell's destruction. So we urgently, we purposefully press ourselves into God's kingdom by His grace. Also, not just because we don't want to be in hell, but also to realize the blessedness of one who is in the kingdom of God. What blessing it is to belong to God, to belong to Christ. Therefore, may God help us to live as children of light, having been enlightened by His Word, so that we faithfully live 
in obedience to Him, making right use of the possessions that God has placed in our hearts. See, God will never bring someone screaming and kicking into heaven. God make us willing. Today, if you find yourself still so unwilling to live for Christ and to use your possessions right, then there's something wrong. But may God help us to remember that we belong to Christ so that we joyfully give of ourselves for the cause of God's kingdom. So that if we were to be asked to give an account today how we have used our time, our money, our everything, we will be able to, to not hide in shame before God. Let us not destroy our future by wasting our present, by living only for the here and now. But let us live in the present in light of the eternity to come so that we may hear him say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen.